Super cool. All right, then. Um, today, guys, we are having an awesome, it's going to be awesome, uh, webinar with uh, Leon Rope. Uh, Leon's uh, up there with one of my uh, oldest uh, original students, um, Leon Emmanuel. He's actually on the call as well. Oh, um, Em's on the call. Yeah, there he is. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, uh, Leon basically took my ideas. I actually had a few drinks with uh, Leon, me and Leon's mouth yep. a couple of times, become friends. And um, he took my ideas and basically developed them into his own sort of process and, and has taken that and been able to become profitable as a trader and consistently over a long period of time um, trading his ideas. And one of the big things that Leon's really good at is identifying certain levels that are, have more gravitas than others. And hopefully we can, uh, we're going to learn about that today. So Leon, yes, over to you. Thank you, mate. Um, much appreciated. So supply and demand Forex trading. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard about supply and demand uh, trading, and I'm going to be basically just giving my take and my ideas and thoughts and how I've been trading supply and demand. Um, it's, it's different from what you tend to see online um, and on, on, on YouTube. So um, the agenda for today is going to be uh, determining value because without understanding value, um, you know, supply and demand just won't, it won't work. It's basically just like trading support and resistance. You have to have uh, a directional bias and um, in, every, in every, you know, asset fit, um, class that you're buying or selling, you really need to know how to determine value. We've got DBR, RBD, or HHL, HHHL, or LHLL, bit of a mouthful, but I'll explain that when I get to it. Um, you've got drawing supply and demand zones on the candlestick price chart, so I'll go over exactly how I draw um, these zones on a price chart. What makes a good supply or demand zone? Because not all supply and demand zones are created equal. And I'll be going over some live chart analysis and uh, some trade examples. Um, support and resistance or supply and demand is a common question I get. Um, what's the difference between them if there is a difference? Um, and I'll be basically showing you how to really kind of um, trade them together. Um, and differences and also the supply and demand equation and that's basically uh, to do with forced and willing supply and demand so um, determining value um, I hope everyone's uh, can hear me everyone's okay still everyone's still there yeah, still yeah, well, yeah. All right, all right, brilliant brilliant by the way if you want to you know just chime in ask me anything uh, please do and because I don't want to leave anyone you know, behind if they're, you know, if I've gone a bit too far, they don't understand anything. Yeah. Yeah, well, Matt. Oh, brilliant, 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 brilliant. Okay, so first things first is, and I'm sure you will know this, but... Hello? Someone's got their hey, microphone open. Do you want to just shut your mics, guys? Just mute. Yeah, mute it until maybe you're ready to, uh, you know, to ask a question. Yep. Yeah. Okay. All right. So I'll continue on. And we know that um, pretty much the markets are run, before its market anyway, it's run by the bank. And this is a Euro FX survey 2017. Um, and basically, this is the top 10 overall market share of the banks, um, of, of basically the FX market, sorry in the top 10 banks and their market share in 2017 and this was 2016 and pretty much you've got top 10 bank banks you know city more um jp morgan us uh, ubs etc they their market share overall is around 60 percent of the market and then you know everyone else is just uh again some other financial institutions and, and banks so i say that because um we are in their game. We're in their field. Um, you know, retail traders make up something like, you know, maybe six, 7% of the, uh, the Forex market, even though it's a massive market, 
it's all something like four trillion, five trillion or something like that. Um, and even if, you know, 7% of that is still a lot of uh, money. But this is, these are the guys that basically create the price on the price chart. So these guys aren't looking at, you know, uh, candlesticks and um, and uh, and certain levels. If you know, I mean, well, they are looking at certain price levels, but they're not looking at you know basically like price action. These guys are creating the price action. So what are they? What are these guys looking at? Right? If they're looking at making decisions on buying and selling, it can't just be technical patterns they're looking at. There's got to be something beyond the price chart that they're looking at. If they're the ones creating the price action, so. That leads us to fundamentals and really determining value. And what the uh, financial institutions do through fundamentals, well, in my opinion, there's three main uh, reasons for um, the... Hello, is everyone there? Hello? Hello, yeah, still here. Yeah. All right, no worries. Yeah, sorry, it's just that you know what happened on, on my screen, like your name's just kind of dropped off the side of my screen, so I thought something had happened. No worries. So I'll continue. In, in, in my opinion, there are three main reasons why the market moves. One is fundamentals um, and, uh, and sentiment, which is basically value. Um, you've got risk sentiment, which is basically uh, where you have... Um, financial institutions and money will flow into safe haven assets like, for example, gold, government treasury bonds in uh, the Forex world. It's uh, the Japanese yen and the Swiss franc when risk is on, basically meaning that uh, everything is all good with the world and uh, investors have got risk appetite and they want a bigger return. They'll go into higher yielding assets um, and higher yielding currencies regarding interest rates um, and uh, that would be, for example, the dollar um, and commodity currencies like the Australian dollar, New Zealand dollar, Canadian dollar, etc. Right. And then you've also got liquidity um, and liquidity is to do with stop hunting. If there's not enough, you know, buy or sell orders, the market will um, seek those orders, as we know. But um, when it comes to fundamentals and value, these are the main three things that we need to look at is GDP. And the business cycle. So financial institutions, again, will put their, invest their money in a currency and in a country that is in the, for example, um, expansion or boom phase, rather than uh, putting their money into a country that is going into uh, a contraction or recession or bust phase. Inflation and inflation targets, central banks have got a 2% target and they really want to uh, get to that inflation prices target and the way that they can do that is via interest rates and the interest rate cycle and uh, not to get into it too much but if you do want to um, you know learn about any any of these or if you want to touch up on your fundamentals and really how I trade the fundamentals um, there's a link take a picture if you want and uh, that's pretty much it but fundamentals and determining value is what we need to do right when it comes to um, our directional bias and uh, buying strength versus weakness. Anyone got any questions or anything like that? Yeah, I am. So, so value, what you're saying is that mm -hmm. what, what, once you've got like your fundamental direction, uh -huh. but by understanding what a central bank's doing with interest rates and uh -huh. value in the business cycle, you're essentially saying that, that value would represent a, a, a something cheap within within that context absolutely cheap we're looking for cheap we're looking for bargain prices that's right. pretty much what we're looking for we're looking for cheap and what and i kind of focus on what's a bargain prices i try not to look at what is potentially expensive it's easier for me to um look at uh what is a bargain price from gdp from inflation or well, from interest rates and inflation etc and what's really you know the value that's what i'm that's what i'm looking at right so 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 how that would play out on a chart is it would, it would look like a bag of spanners as it's going down against against you know whatever currency but mm -hmm. ultimately but ultimately in the backdrop you have that broader understanding that this is yeah. this is actually you know this is an opportunity this is not right uh, so, 
so so for example we would look at for example the, the, the maybe the dollar yen right would be a, a great example or any kind of risk off currency where um it strengthens based off of um basically just uh, some sort of uh you know economic uncertainty political uncertainty um you know uh, or interest rate say interest rate but um some um uh, risk of sentiment basically but if you're looking at it looking at the japanese yen from or, or for example, the Swiss franc economically and where they are in their interest rate cycle or where they are with, with regards to inflation targets, they're, they're, they're terrible. But risk sentiment or risk off sentiment where uh, money will flow into um, the Swiss franc or the Japanese yen making it stronger, what that does is it brings price to a certain level when, you're, when you want to buy the dollar, and what I'll do is I'll probably explain it better on a price chart. Let's go to dollar, right? Risk sentiment was, can everyone see my chart as well? Yep. Yep. So risk, risk was off, so money was flowing into the Japanese yen. When risk, when risk goes back on, the Japanese yen, if you're looking at it fundamentally, is basically worse than the uh, than 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 the uh, the US dollar. So risk sentiment, what it does, and risk off sentiment will drive prices to where we want to be buyers of the US dollar because we know at this price level, right, when risk comes back on and when fundamentals are in play and when tr um, investors want a bigger return on their money. So, for example, the Japanese yen, their interest rates are like minus was it was minus 0 0.1 or something like that compared to the dollar where you're getting was it 2.5 percent where's the money going to go this is an absolute bargain does that make sense yep yeah it doesn't make it, it makes if it doesn't make sense to someone just let me know yeah so ba so basically imagine it just as, as like an individual if you if you if you're on a high street and you you know, you've got an opportunity to put your money in two banks. One has an interest rate where they say, we're going to take money off you for putting money into it to your Absolutely. account. Or you can put it over here on the other side of the high street and you can get 3% interest where you're going to put your money. Your money, that's exactly it. And that's risk on. You know, when risk is on, when the fundamentals are in play, you know, that's what you're seeing pretty much you know, develop in the market. Risk sentiment and risk off sentiment drives prices to where we would want to be and can drive prices to where we want to be buyers and where a level is cheap, right? And we'll go into this basically, this, this trade, for example, on the dollar yen um, a bit later as well. So, fundament so, so technically and fundamentally, what we want to look at is business cycle, inflation and interest rates, and determine what is the uh, the stronger currency versus the weaker currency, and then look for, for example, if we're looking to buy the dollar, dollar yen, you'd be looking for just demand zones, and those would be areas of value. Make sense? Right. So you're actually you're actually you you're having a bias, and then you are only trading in that direction. That's exactly at it. cheap prices, right? Yeah, at cheap prices, and and technically, I'm going to show you exactly why the areas of demand logically in my in my head, you know, and how I kind of figured out the levels, um, and uh, I'll show you that pretty much uh, in um, in a diagram as far as I'll draw it out for you guys. Leon. Yep. Um, are you going to give us a demonstration of how you actually figure out the um, sentiment and the fundamentals? Like uh, going to a website and do you put it in a spreadsheet? Or? I actually have a spreadsheet. I actually do have a spreadsheet. Um, and it's for the, uh, basically the traders that I do mentor, but I will show it to you. Right. I will show it to you. It was uh, created by a, a trader. I'm not sure if he's in the room. I don't think he is. Uh, Shane. Um, I invited him in. I don't think he could probably make it. Our Fitz is here. Um, and uh, we kind of sat down, worked out um, what we want to look at. And uh, over the past, I would say, what, maybe two months, three months, the fundamentals have actually uh, really kind of played out. And I'll show you the uh, the spreadsheet as well. Mm. 
Cool, thank you. All right. Um, remind me actually at the end, matter of fact, yeah? Ian? Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, we'll do it. Yeah, no worries, mate. Okay, so RBD, DBR, or HHHL, LHLL. Basically, when everyone thinks about supply and demand, they think about rally based drop, drop based rally. Right? That's what pretty much everyone is told. And um, so you've got basically rally base drop. And then what happens is, is that if prices come back up to this area, that's where you want to be a seller. And then you've got drop base rally. And then when prices come back down to this area, this is where it's supposed to be a buyer. So you're looking at imbalances in supply and demand. So demand and then you've got the imbalance takes place right here and that's where traders are looking at and then you've got rally base rally so for example if you get a situation like this it'd be rally base rally and then the imbalance in demand so there's more demand and supply here and then you'd wait for prices to come back down and then look for buy trade um and same thing with drop base drop now what again i don't think there's necessarily a um it's just a basically a way of or the way that i looked at supply and demand and what kind of made more sense to me in the context of uh things like fundamentals was higher highs higher lows and lower highs lower lows so what i realized was is that if you get a move up right this is going to be demand and this potentially when it starts to pull back is going to be supply now we know this to be true because obviously buyers there was demand for price if this is a price chart self-evident now we know that this is going to be the cheap area and this has to be an expensive area simply because prices couldn't go any higher. The, you know, buyers were no longer interested at whatever this price level was. Now, from this low to this high, this is expensive and this is cheap. 50% of this has to be what, we would, what I would call fair value. So whenever we get pullbacks, and this is basically what Fibonacci is. Fibonacci is just, you know, um, a, a discounts pretty much 32%, 61% is just a, just a discount on what is cheap and what would be considered expensive. And so what I realized was if prices start to come higher, and this is going to be an expensive area, Right, this level here is an expensive area. If prices continue to push past this, what would be considered an expensive area, then this has to be a strong level of demand. This has to be considered an absolute bargain at this price because as prices were going higher and higher and higher, this could have sold off but it didn't and it carried on going through so what i realized was that this has to be a strong level of demand right from a technical analysis from a fundamental you know perspective prices i guess um you know are really kind of uncontrollable that's the reason why you know um I guess inflation and the central banks try to control inflation try to control prices but if we get, for example, a sentiment, you know, play or we get this area pullback, this has to be, in my, with my logical opinion, if you're looking at this being the absolute bargain and this being the new expensive area, the best place to buy is not at a previous supply zone now turned into support that to be considered resistance right that can't be the best area to buy 
yes, we know as far as technical patterns are concerned, this is what people do. But from a higher probability perspective, here has to be, because it's proven to be an absolute bargain in the same way that this low to this high was proven to be a bargain expensive. This is the low, this breaks past the uh, previous expensive area, new expensive area. So this from here to here has to be the strongest area of demand. And this is gonna be you know, your supply level. Providing fundamentals are still in play and this is you know and um i did a video on this on 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 youtube and you know it's called like the complex pullback and also as well with um if anybody's ever traded um uh things like gartley patterns and uh and, and butterflies and stuff like that or cipher patterns and what these really these patterns are for example with the complex pullback um you know traders will get long here right thinking that this is past support sorry, past resistance, to, should turn support. And then what happens is they end up getting cream there because they see some price action and then they put their stop losses there. And then what happens is they were buying at fair value or thereabouts, maybe just above, maybe just below, but it wasn't the best place to buy, which was a proven demand zone, the strongest area. This is where the start of the move Occurred. And then what happens is they get lower highs, lower lows. And trend traders, and everybody's taught to trend, uh, you know, to, to, to chase the trend. And what is, you know, a trend in definition, lower highs, lower lows is going to be the start of a new trend. Not realizing that the start of the move, the best place to buy was actually right here. So what happens is they end up waiting for a pullback, right? No idea about fundamentals either. They end up getting short here, stops above the high, and then prices end up getting them twice. And then they say, trend trading doesn't work. What's going on? Blah, 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 blah. Right? We're buying at levels of demand. We have to because it's proven. Remember, that this is where the banks were buying. The banks to prove that this is where they were buying in the past. And if the fundamentals are still the same, negative sentiment can just push prices to where we want them. We want to be a buyer. And this is cheap. This is value because it was proven value in the past. Yeah, and can you just, just say on that as well? <laughs> the, yep. Like, when was the last time any of us created an engulfing candle? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Right, we just don't do it. It's not yeah. us doing it. So whoever was in charge of moving that price from that level yeah. to it, yeah. Exactly. To there is obviously uh, huge. That's exactly it. You know, and that's why I, I did the uh, the euro money because just to prove the point that it's like 10 banks that run, you know, that have a 60% market share. They're the ones, they're not looking at, they're not looking at price action. Yeah, they're looking at something beyond the price. What is it that they're looking at? And it has to be, you know, things like fundamental sentiment, whatever it is, you know, that they look at as far as liquidity and that. And then this is where we want to be buyers. And traders who trade, for example, you know, Gartley patterns and the, you know that X to A, A to B leg, and then they, you know, they draw that pattern there, and then it's the A, B to C, C to D, and it usually ends around here. They're just buying into a demand zone. There's no reason, there's no logical reason for, you know, these Fibonacci patterns. It's got to hit this and it's got to hit that. It's just when prices come down to this demand zone, all they're taking advantage of is what would be known as the X leg, which is the strongest area of demand proven. In the same way that if this is supply now, that is supply, this has to be an expensive area, right? So when prices come up to here, it's proven to be expensive because there are no buyers anymore. Again, obviously, depending on fundamentals, etc. But if we were looking to get short on this and we were waiting for prices to come back up, 
right? It's proven that this is an expensive area or for example, a cheap area for, for the, for the, uh, for the quote currency, you know, um, and this is where we would want to buy the quote currency because we know that this was an absolute bargain. Prices fell away. Something must have changed maybe sentiment wise or fundamental wise. When prices come back up here, this is where we want to be sellers because it's proven to be an expensive or, you know, in the case of, you know, Forex, I tried not to look at anything being expensive, but just this is a cheap level for the, uh, for the quote currency. Everyone follow along? Yeah, cheers, mate. Makes sense. Yeah, is, super is, interesting. Man. Are you um, going off the daily chart with this? Is this what it's meant to be on? Sorry? Is this meant to be the daily chart? This yes, level? yes. Yeah. So I look at, exactly, I look at, I look at daily levels. I definitely look at daily levels. So I'm looking for proof of value, right? Proof of value is always in my mind when I'm looking at, you know, demand and supply zones. And again, with, with rally based drop, drop based rally, the emphasis is more on just looking for imbalances in supply and demand. I'm looking for proof of value. And higher highs and higher lows are proof of value. Expensive, prices break through. This is going to be the demand zone. That's going to be the demand zone. All right, prices don't break through now. In fact, if prices fail to go higher, then yes, there is demand here, but is it a strong level of demand? Can that be considered a strong level of demand if it can't push past the, uh, the expensive level? It's a decent level of demand, but you want the best areas of demand. Proof of definite 100% value is if prices go past what would be a considered a previous expensive level. And this is where you want to get long. So you're looking for levels where price puts in new highs and lows and ignoring e those. That are exactly. Got it. Well, I wouldn't say 100% ignoring because there's always, you know, exceptions to the rule and, you know, depending on, you know, the fundamentals, I will definitely still trade um, uh, levels where you do get, you know, demand that will go up to probably the expensive area. Again, depends on the risk reward. Um, but mo the majority of the time I'm looking for new highs and then pullbacks into demand.